Sports, 105.7 The Point, everything alternative, doing things a little bit different this time around. We are in a Point Production studio, and ladies and gentlemen, I've been practicing this for about a week, so hopefully I give it justice, I do it justice. The WWE's apex predator, the Viper, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Randy Orton. What's up, Randy? What's up, Donnie? How you doing? I'm doing very well. How was that? I mean, I know it's not... You know, I mean, I know it's not the the best that you get on a daily basis, but that's not so bad, right? It was the best I've ever heard, Donnie. You know what? I appreciate that. And if Absolute you could best. if you could continue that line of BS throughout the interview, I would greatly appreciate it. I plan on it. Donnie. All right, all right, good. <laughs> well, one of the things that I that I found out when doing research to talk to you today, Randy, was that not only was your father a WWE superstar. WWF superstar back in the day, but your uncle mm-hmm. was a wrestler. Yeah. Your grandfather was a wrestler. Mm-hmm. So, did you have any other choice <laughs> but, but to be a wrestler? And I know that they tried to talk you out of it as sure. well. Talk about that a little bit. Well, growing up, you know, I, I you know, it was what my dad did for a living. It's what my uncle, and my grandpa did, and and I was aware of it. I was involved. I would travel with my father. I. I was around Hulk Hogan's and Andre the Giants and Hillbilly Jim's and Hacksaw Jim Duggins and Junkyard Dogs and Don Morocco's and they were at the house. Mom cooked dinner for them when they came through St. Louis. And it was just kind of my little inside and I didn't really know where it was gonna ever go. I never saw myself doing it. And uh, the parents didn't really have to talk me out of getting into the business because I was never really talking about being in the business. I was a scrawny kid, tall, skinny, Hadn't really grown into my, you know, my feet yet until I even got in the business. But just in high school and stuff, I, I, you know, man, I didn't like school too much. Didn't really want to go to college. Wasn't really uh, informed on all, you know, my my uh, options. And ended up going into the Marine Corps actually before I became a WWE superstar or whatever you want to call it. But uh, you know, any time it might come up. Mom shot it down, and, and it, but it was never really that big of a possibility for me. Not until I got the bad conduct discharge from the United States Marine Corps did I realize, oh, crap, what am I going to do now? You know, mm-hmm. I worked at a gas station midnights down the street after I came home for about a month living in my parents' basement, and it was like one day I just said, Dad, do you think I could be a wrestler? He said, I don't know, son, because, you know, he, he didn't leave on the best terms from WWF back in the day. You know, he used to get in a bit of trouble, and so did my uncle. So he thought maybe the Orton name had been blackballed from the wrestling industry. But he called a couple of his buddies, Tony Guerrilla, Jack Lanza. They were agents at the time, uh, road agents. And we just, uh, well, they had a show in St. Louis in October of 99. I came down, met Lanza, met Guerrilla, and they hired me right on the spot. Just because I was a third generation wrestler. And at the time, The Rock was the only other guy. So they had something there. They had something that they could maybe help use to mold me into some guy. You know, I was a big kid. I was like 250 pounds at the time. So they thought, okay, we'll sign him. And then from there, it just took off. They sent me to Louisville, Kentucky. I was there about a year and a half and I was getting paid to learn how to wrestle. And I was with a bunch of other guys who was there paying to learn how to wrestle. It was a wrestling school at the time. So there's only a few WWE developmental contract guys like myself and the re- but everyone else there that they were like uh you know Olympic athletes or like four-time state champions. That's where I met John Cena, Brock Lesnar, uh Batista, Mark Henry and Big Show were down there. They had some weight issues if you could believe that at the time and <laughs> they were down there cutting weight. So it was just, you know, here I am this I just turned 20. You know, I'm like, oh, my God. You know, here I am, uh, besides the Marine Corps, for the first time living on my own, wondering, you know, what my future was going to hold. But ended up working out, and, uh, you know, man, I'm living the dream right now. I really am. At any point, was that overwhelming for you when you were down there? Oh, very much so. Just like I said, you know, you got, like, Brock Lesnar's and John Cena's. You know, John's always been built like a brick shit house. you know. So, it's it, you know, it was intimidating because I, I wasn't – I was, you know, a high school-level athlete. I wasn't this all-American. That There was other guys that no one's heard their names before. Uh, a guy, uh, his, his ring name was Slick Robbie D. He's no longer with us, rest his soul, but he was an all-American Shelton Benjamin, who was uh, sure. on TV for a while with us, Shelton Benjamin, he was probably one of the most pure athletes I've ever seen in my life. He could walk from uh, ring post to ring post on the top rope 
like a tight tightrope in it, and no one had ever seen anyone be able to do that before. You know, and here these guys, it's like it's their 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 jungle gym, the ring. You know, doing back flips, and I've never been able to do that kind of stuff. So at that early stage of my career, here I am learning the basics, having trouble with that, and I'm thinking, man, there's no way. But it, it was it was really the fact that I didn't have a lot of friends down there, and a lot of people knew the only reason I was there because of my dad. So I didn't really have, I didn't have playtime. I didn't have a bunch of buddies. I had to earn their respect. And eventually, a year and a half later, Brock Lesnar, myself, John Cena, we were the first three brought up and put on uh, the road to do, we weren't on TV at the time, but for about a half a year, just did dark matches to gain experience working in front of the large crowds. So in that year and a half, I went from being, you know, the drizzling absolute, you know what, to being one of the top contenders down there to get on the road and then you know the rest is history really did you catch a lot of stuff from the other wrestlers for being an orton and for being a a a third generation wrestler like you said the only sure. reason that you were there right. was because well, of yeah. the name yeah exactly like we do drills where you know you throw a drop kick and uh you know you, you do like a, a very basic maneuver and they just assumed that because of me growing up in the business that I knew how to do this stuff. I had never been in the ring before. So here I am trying to throw a drop kick for the first time in my life. It's not, you know, I like barely, you know, came above the guy's waist. And they're like, is this guy for real? Is he really down here getting paid? To do, are, you, are we, is this serious right now? Like I had no skills whatsoever, but that just made me work harder. But yeah, I caught a lot of slack, you know, I, no one wanted to talk to me. I was just kind of the kid. You know, I didn't have an attitude or nothing. It took a while before the attitude <laughs> became present. And the, the head kind of swelled up. But uh, at first, I was just as humble as you can be and, you know, didn't say much and just learned. Watched a lot of old tapes. Uh, you know, my dad would send me tapes. WWE would send me tapes. And I think that where I got uh, a lot better quickly was from watching those old school tapes because the psychology of what we do in the ring has never really changed. The moves and the pace has, but it's still storytelling, basic storytelling 101. So watching those old, those old tapes, guys like Steamboat, you know, in my pops, Dick Murdoch, the way they did it, you know, it wasn't our pace, but you could pick out what they were doing and why they were doing it. And then it all kind of light bulb, you know, would come on every other week. And I'd, oh, I'd get another aspect of how you do this and what it means and how to make it make sense. Because anyone can go in their backyard and body slam, you know, their brother on the grass and call it wrestling and backyard wrestling. You know, well, you got to be able to entertain millions of people or, you know, 80,000 people I've worked in front of and you got to like be able to hold them all on the edge of their seat and you got to anticipate what they want to see and you got to listen to them and if they're going one way but you're planning on going another way how can I get them to come back around and see see you know see what I want to the story I want to tell and and I'm still learning and we all are you know very good is there a like sort of a, a maybe not singular piece of advice but is there something that your dad told you that you really took to heart that that you know maybe even still sticks with you today yeah you know and it, it's something that i i tend to forget from time to time but basically keep your mouth shut and your ears open and that was something early on like when i got uh, to be backstage and was on the road and traveling with these guys and it you gotta remember 10 years ago when i first was on the road <clears throat> you had like the undertaker was full-time yeah, Triple H, Shawn Michaels, Ric Flair, uh, Batista, John Cena, they were still coming up. But you had the old timers like Bob Holly, Bubba Ray, Devon, JBL, Chris Benoit, who I know I'm not probably supposed to mention his name, but no matter what he did, he was one of the most aggressive, intense in ring performers that I've ever stepped in the ring with. So, off his ability, you know, mentioning his name along with all those other guys. Uh, it was, it was intimidating. It was different. You know, I was the youngest kid in the locker room for a long time. And the guys that were there 10 years, that wasn't necessarily a long amount of time to be, you know, to be back there. You know, now I've been back there almost a decade. I remember when The Undertaker had just been there a decade and it was the decade of destruction and they came out with the t-shirts and the hats. It's a decade of destruction. That was a big deal. Now here I am. I've been here 10 years and besides Mark Henry, uh, you know, Taker, Hunter, 
uh, they're still around, but not in a full-time aspect. Like, there's not a lot of other guys that have been around longer than me. So, like, things have really changed in the last 10 years, and it's kind of like the Rams. They they had, you know, the, the, the uh, world championship, but now they have a younger team, and they're kind of rebuilding. They're in that rebuilding process. I think our roster is similar in many ways, where I used to be the youngest at 22. Now half the locker room's 22. You know, instead of walking into the locker room and seeing all these grown behemoths, these men with hair on their chest and <laughs> grisly old voices and drinking beer after their matches, now it's, you know, everyone's got their Gatorade and they're, you know, they're all shredded and, you know, but it's just, it's not as intimidating, I think, as it used to be. And I think a little bit of the, uh, I don't know, the allure of our business has went away with that. Because the Rocks, Austins, Takers, Shawn Michaels, I mean, you don't have that 20 guys that can all have a main event match. Now, you know, on SmackDown, you, you got myself, Mark Henry, Sheamus, and Christian. And we're, it's a rebuilding process. It's a younger locker room. We're trying to get those Ted DiBiase's, those Cody Rhodes, uh, Dolph Ziggler's, Kofi's, even The Miz. He's got a lot of room to grow. We're trying to get those guys, the mid-carters and low-carters, up to the level so that hopefully in five years we got 10, 12 top guys that can, you know, draw a whole live event, you know, give people a reason to come buy a ticket. Boy, it just sure seems to me, though, that those mid-tier guys, it just seems like just to me as a fan, you know, mm -hmm. as, as a guy that watches every week, uh, it just seems like you've got a lot of those types of guys, though. A but a, But a, a lot of quality guys. Yeah. All those guys you mentioned are really good at what they do. They are, but they're only as good as, you know, if they only have three minutes on Raw or SmackDown of a two-hour show, of a two-hour show, if they only have three minutes of that two-hour show to to try and get themselves over or display, you know, to the world what they're able to do, you know, that's not enough time, you know. And uh, I think that's probably the biggest problem is that there's not like, you know, they'll go with the guy for a couple weeks, maybe a month, he'll start to be cooking, then all of a sudden they pull back and then you don't see him for a couple weeks. That hurts. You know, I, I got to where I am today because – you know, for six, seven years, I didn't miss a TV, barring any injuries, of course. I, you know, I was everywhere you looked. I was involved with Triple H and Shawn Michaels. I've gotten beat up and beat up Goldberg and Scott Steiner and Hulk Hogan, and the list goes on. I've been able to work with all those guys. Cody Rhodes, Ted DiBiase, they were the last guys to get to work with DX, the, of the young guys. Mm -hmm. Triple H and Shawn Michaels, uh, working with them, being in evolution myself with Ric Flair and Triple H, just you get so much experience points, you know, from working with these guys and not only learning inside the ring stuff, but locker room etiquette and just how to conduct yourself, how to be a WWE superstar, you know, and a lot of that, you know, there's not as many of us that have been around to get to all these guys. You know, we got it. We got a job to do, too on TV and it's hard to get in everyone's ear. So it's really just kind of, you have like a side project and I'll have like a, a side project or two at a time. Like that Jinder Mahal, he was cooking for a while. Now mm -hmm. they pulled back on him and it's like, I see a future in him. He's a big kid. Boy, he's a great bad guy. You love yeah. to hate that guy. Right, right. And that's, and you saying that, you know, that shows me that, you know, we've done right by him, but he's kind of fizzled out. You know, him and great Kali were doing their thing and you thought, you were going to expect some big things from this kid. And now all of a sudden it's like, man, he hasn't been on TV in a couple of weeks. You know, like that people forget. They, you got to, you know, burn it in their brain of who this guy is, what he's about, what, you know, this means to him and what he's after. And you got to, you know, ref keep it refreshed, keep it going, show what happened last week, have it lead to something, you know, develop these characters. And it's hard, you know, like our writers, our, uh, our creative team, have, they have a tough job, you know, but it, uh, it's on them, but most of it's on us, mm -hmm. you know, it, most of it's on us. Now, do you, uh, the, the way that you speak so passionately about kind of the, the angles and the way that things go, I mean, can you see yourself working in, you know, the creative part, maybe after your career is over, which we know is a long way away, but no, 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 no never. Um, I love what I do. I, I love showing up to the show, 
couple hours later, you know, they close the or they open the doors so the fans start coming in. You know, we have to leave the uh, the arena area. We're all backstage, and you hear those fans come in, and then they start to rumble, and they'll, you know, tonight I'm sure they'll break out in an RKO chant, you know, or welcome home, welcome home, Randy, you know, like that. That that's awesome, you know, and every you know Australia, South Africa, Qatar, in the Middle East, all over Europe. Central America, you know, South America, you know, Canada, we're everywhere. And every show, they have a different level of energy, some higher than others, but it's always high. And it always gets you feeling that way. And that's what I love about this business. Walking down the ring, whether I was a bad guy or a good guy, you love it all. As long as there's a response, you're doing something right. Mm. And that's what I love about it. Being in the ring and being able to kind of, you know, dictate how the fans feel. You know, get them behind me and then get them really want to see me kick the living crap out of this guy that I'm facing. And being able to not manipulate's the wrong word, but in a way manipulate the fans to react a certain way and then succeed. There's there's really not, not a better feeling. It's kind of like being an adrenaline junkie, uh, adrenaline junkie and, you know, going 150 on your Harley or, or, or jumping out of a plane with a parachute on. Like I, I've done the 150 on a Harley, haven't, you know done the parachute thing yet but that adrenaline rush like that's what i related to is that every night i get to have this adrenaline rush that no one really can relate to and that's what i love about it being backstage and being involved with creative and you know even teaching guys like i don't think that's really my role Mm -hmm. i was born in a sense to do what i'm doing now and when i'm not able to do it anymore then i think i'm done I, I, uh, I'm I sure there'll be talks like, Randy, we'd like to have you do this or that. But, you know, I got a family at home. Like I know uh, a lot of my fans are aware. I, I've been married four years now, just celebrated my four-year anniversary last week. I have a three-year-old daughter who just started school. So I don't get to see them much. And, and you know, I started early, so give me another 10 years, I'll be 40. And, you know, if that's it for me, that's it. I think a 20-year career save your money, invest well, be smart. A lot of us aren't, and mm-hmm. a lot of us aren't fortunate enough, fortunate enough in this day and age to make the kind of money where you can retire at 40, you know, in this business is what I'm saying. So I want to be one of those guys that can enjoy my family, do some, do what I want to do, travel and actually get to tour, you know, be a tourist in these beautiful places that I've been all over the world that I've never been able to see. Take my daughter and my wife to these places and get to, enjoy being a dad, enjoy being a husband, because in a very limited sense right now, am am I able to do that? Mm -hmm. You know, I love what I do and it's my livelihood, you know, it's bringing home the bacon. So there's that too. Right. Uh, but when I'm able to retire, I will retire. And I want to say that I'll be able to walk away, but in a sense, I'm sure Vince will have me, you know, by the balls somehow where I'll be doing stuff, you know, but uh, as a, on a full-time basis, no way. Right on. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some in-ring stuff that's going on here lately. Sure. Uh, you have got the big 6'4", 420-pound Mark Henry to deal with at Hell in a Cell on Sunday. That's right. How do you take on a guy that's that friggin' big? My, because I mean, you're it's no small tough. guy yourself. No, I mean, I'm, I'm about average for our locker room. Mark Henry, though, he's on the, the other end of the spectrum. He's a big guy. Uh, and, you know, he, he's the world's strongest man. That's his, his, his gimmick, right? Well, it's not a gimmick. That dude is strong. And there's stuff he's done that throughout history, like, only two or three people have been able to do what he's done. There's a lot of records that he has, world records, that haven't been broken from like 15 years ago. There's a lot of the weird like strongman things, like where they pick up the 400 pound boulders and put them, you know, like he can do some of that stuff. Like he, he has grip strength that is just, you know, unimaginable. I've seen him take an iron skillet and roll it and you, you, you know, roll it into like a, you know, like a newspaper. You know what I mean? Like yeah. You literally roll it up. And um, that same skillet, you're like, okay, what's it, where'd, you buy that, where'd, where'd you buy that skillet? What, you know, gag gift did you get? You know what I mean? But right. no, you take that same skillet, you look at it, and you're thinking, how the hell did he? He's just strong. And when you're in the ring with him, you feel that strength. And he's so big, you know, I'm, like you said, I'm a big guy. I go to the gym, I can push some weight around, but that power slam I do, 
the the DDT where the guy's feet are hanging. I need to come up with names for my moves because I don't even, you know, the backbreaker, all that stuff I do. I can't do that to him. Right. You know, I just barely was able to DDT him with his feet on the ropes at uh, the last pay-per-view, but that wasn't enough because he beat me for my title, you know, at Night of Champions. But as you're saying, of course, at Hell in a Cell uh, next Sunday, I believe it's in New Orleans, I get another shot, and it's in the Hell in a Cell now. I don't know if he's had a Hell in a Cell match. I want to say that's a no. I've been in three of them. I've wrestled The Undertaker, John Cena, and Sheamus in a Hell in a Cell. I'm 2-0, and oh, or 2-1, and one rather, in, in my Hell in a Cell matches. So I got a little experience going into this match that he doesn't have. But, you know, I'm going to be locked in a cage with this guy, man. Like you said, a 400-pound man, you know, he's, he's with some strength behind him. You know, there's nowhere to run for neither of us. But as far as what I'm going to do to get my title back, you know, that's I'm still on the drawing board with that one. Right on. Now, tonight, if I'm not mistaken, if I heard correctly while I was uh, watching Raw last night, you have uh, got Christian I do. Uh, on, on tap. And Christian just keeps wanting another shot and one another shot. shot. Yeah, How man. many more shots well, do we give this guy? Well, I don't know if this counts as a shot because usually that shot's for the title. For the title, <laughs> right. I don't have the title anymore. <laughs> right. So now I'm just going to have fun whipping his ass in front of my hometown, really. That's, <laughs> I don't know if anyone saw what I did to Cody Rhodes last week on SmackDown, but I left him a, a, you know, wallowing around in his own blood. Um, so, you know, we'll see. I, I think after last week's SmackDown and what I did to Cody Rhodes, I got a little fire behind me. I'm on a roll. Well, and also, too, and I wanted to mention this, you, you, I don't know the best way to put this, but you kind of pulled a Mark Henry after you destroyed him. Mm -hmm. You destroyed everything in your path. Yeah. Was that sort of a an answer to Mark Henry? Hey, man, sure. I'm just as nutty as you are? Well, yeah, I was pissed, man. I'm a nine-time world champion, and he came out there. I, I really thought I could take him at Night of Champions, and uh, I wasn't able to hit him with an RKO. That might be the reason, but he hit me with that world's strongest slam. That was it. He took my knee out right before, so I was I was worse for wear, man. He, 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 he won fair and square. I'll give him that. But, uh, you know, I do have that rematch clause, and we are in my hometown tonight, so I might have to just throw that in tonight and get my title back here in St. Louis. That sounds good to me. I would love to see that, yeah. as a matter of fact. Yeah. Just as a fan, I would love to see it. Well, Randy, uh, you have been nothing but kind and courteous, and we appreciate so much your time. I hope the interview did you justice. And, yes. uh, ladies and gentlemen, tonight uh, at the Scott Trade Center, you can get tickets for as low as $20. The, the lineup is is just fantastic with Seamus and Mark Henry, and it's going to be a great time, so we want you to come out tonight. Yeah, I'll be there as well. St. Louis, come and see your hometown hero, or whatever you want to call me. Like you said, Scott Trade, 7 o'clock, tickets still on sale. I hope to see you there. Very good. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to do it one more time. The WWE's Apex Predator, the Viper, Mr. Randy Orton. Thank you, Randy, so much, man. Thanks, Donnie. All right.